study. Speaking about our study, I hope you as, as well as I are enjoying John and the Gospel of John tonight. We're in chapter 4 uh, and we're going to finish chapter 4. It's week 10 for those of you that are looking at week, week, what week it is. Remember I told you last week that the Gospel of John chapter 4 was divided into two parts. John, a Samaritan woman and a nobleman who meets Jesus. Those are the two parts. We know that God the Son was revealed as living water in verses 1 to 26. God the Son was revealed as the Savior of the world, verses 27 to 42. And God is revealed as worth believing. Tonight again, chapter 4, verse 31 through 54. Last week, we studied the exchange of the woman at the well. And I didn't tell you this, but last week, the Gospel writer is showing you the full range of Jesus' compassion on those around him, no matter how dramatically or drastically opposed to each other they are, or diametri uh, diametrically opposed. We will see in John chapter 4, we already saw the Samaritan woman, we'll finish that up tonight, and then a nobleman. It's a unique study in contrast from Nicodemus of chapter 3 and the Samaritan woman in the first part of, part of chapter 4. So the Samaritan woman was what Jesus was concentrating on in chapter 4. But watch, in John chapter 3 we have Nicodemus. John chapter 4 we have the woman of Samaria. In John chapter 3 it's a male. In John chapter 4, female. In John 3, he's rich, he's famous. Chapter 4, she's poor and unknown. Do you see the, di the, the diametrically opposition? This is Jesus telling you that he's going, and John telling you, that Jesus is going to all levels of society. John 3, Nicodemus is intellectual. John 4, this woman is uneducated, as most women were. John 3, he's a Sanhedrin, he's a leader. In chapter 4, she's rejected. She's had several husbands and really nobody wants to deal with her. In John 3, he's a Pharisee, he's a pure Jew. In John 4, she's a Samaritan, which is viewed as a cult. You can see the opposition. Jesus is going to all sides of society. It's purposeful. John wants you to know without telling you, Jesus is going to the, to the ultra-rich and famous intellectual Pharisee, Jew, pure Jew, and he's going to the female, poor, unknown, uneducated, rejected Samaritan who's of a cult. I told you at the beginning of the study that John will flesh out Jesus. He'll show us his full humanity and his full love for all of us, no matter what state of society you come from, when we're, even when we're poles apart from each other. So tonight we continue in chapter 4 with the effect that Jesus had upon the entire city of Sychar in Samaria. And then we will continue with his exchange to Nicodemus. Let's talk about the results of speaking to the woman at the well. John chapter 4, verse 31 to 34. In the meantime, Jesus is still at the well. His disciples urged him. They came back saying, Rabbi, teacher, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Did anybody bring him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, sometimes reading scripture like this can seem very, very strange to us. Why is Jesus saying these things? Well, he's on a mission. He's saying things for a purpose. Remember, he just told the woman he has water to drink. She had water that she, she, she drank and she'd never thirst again. Now he's telling his disciples, and by the way, he was thirsty when he said that. Now they know he's hungry. He said, I have food that you don't know about. Man, what's going on here? Well, he's teaching. He's teaching his disciples that there's something driving him other than the necessities of life. People think that if they could have their own way in life, they'd be perfectly happy and fulfilled. In so doing, people actually compromise their real happiness. People think that, that their, their, own, their own wishes, once realized, will make them happy. That their own longings fulfilled will satisfy them. That their own decisions, when granted, will make them feel better in life. That's all a mistake. It's a secular lie. Man will never be happy this way. Jesus was telling his disciples that the greatest satisfaction in, for him in life in this case, was not fulfilling his earthly appetites, eating, but in doing the will of the Father. It was more important to him than sustaining his eating. What he was saying, in short, was that his bodily thirst and hunger had been forgotten while he was ministering to the woman at the well. You know, I felt this when I used to preach. Many times I go to the pulpit and I'd be sick. I would, I would feel terrible. I'd be coughing and sneezing. I'd feel like I couldn't get, sick, get another sentence out. Yet I get to that pulpit, I open my scriptures up, I read the word, I pray, and an anointing would come on me, and I forgot all about my sickness. I acted like I wasn't sick. 
And then after I got done, I'd go back to my office and I would feel horrible again. It's because when you're doing the will of God, your necessities, the things that you're thinking about, if you're really doing the will of God, will fade away. That's what Jesus is telling his disciples. John in chapter 4 goes on to show Jesus teaching his disciples about the urgency of spiritual work and opportunity. Do not say that there's four months and then comes the harvest. Now you don't know this, and most readers don't know this, but that was a song in Jesus' day, and it was a proverb in Jesus' day. I'll explain in a moment. So behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Why is he saying that? Again, we'll flesh that out and show you why. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, both, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. So what's he saying? Well, don't say, he tells them, there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Again, this is a popular proverb in Jesus' day for procrastination. There was even a song they sang with these words in it. What Jesus is saying is, we have no time to wait. Now is the spiritual harvest upon us. Man, how true is that for us today, more than ever? Don't think so? Here is a partial chart, I told you I was gonna give it to you, of woke company, companies who are trying to change America and the culture, woke companies. They will amaze you. Amazon, Airbnb, AT&T, Capital One, Sonic, Grubhub, Delta, Expedia, Disney, Comcast, Office Depot, Google, Discover, Stripe, Harry's, Chewy, MBA, Jeep, Wonderful Company, The Wonderful Company, JP Morgan Chase, Kind, PayPal, Lowe's, GoDaddy, Ben & Jerry's, PetSmart, Nextdoor, Viacom, CBS, Best Buy. This article says boycott left-wing companies. Now, I can't tell you what to do. I'll tell you this, Wells Fargo. I'll tell you this, Microsoft. I personally am boycotting these companies. I'm gonna try my best to eliminate all of them. Now, I know what you're thinking, what about Amazon? Everybody goes to Amazon. I'm not faulting you, but I'm telling you, we have to start somewhere. I don't know where you could start. Maybe it's one of them, maybe it's five of them, maybe it's, ten, maybe it's all of them, but we have to start somewhere because basically, this is not what we're about. We are not about this. Why would we support it? I used to buy a awful lot with Lowe's. I'm not anymore, it's not gonna happen. I'm going to personally boycott them. And again, this may be very controversial to a lot of you. Maybe you're saying, oh, Pastor Mark, you know, that's too broad. This, these are the companies who chose this, I didn't. And so whatever you need to do, you need to do it. Will I fault you if you don't? It's not mine to fault you, it's not mine to commend you. It's up to you to search your heart and see what you wanna do. But, this is what Jesus was telling the disciples. I'm not interested in the things of, of the world, even eating and drinking. I wanna be about my Father's business. As you will read in a moment, as Jesus was speaking these words, the fields are ripe for harvest. The Samaritans were, were leaving town and coming across the fields in masses towards him. He probably pointed to them as he spoke to his disciples. The eagerness of the people the Jews regarded with prejudice and rejected showed that they were like grains ready for harvest. You want proof? Well, here it is. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they're already white for harvest. He's telling them, right now, start, look at those fields. Amazingly, Jesus changes the minds of his Jewish enemies, Samaritans. They believe on him as Messiah. And even more amazing, he, stay, he, he stays with them two more days, as I'll show you in a moment. And many Samaritans, right after he says that, of that city, believed on him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they're coming from the fields. They urged him to stay with him, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. So think about it. Jesus tells the disciples, Look to the fields. Now's your harvest ready. And I'm sure when those people start coming, Jesus was pointing them. He planted a massive seed in Sychar and Samaria. He was talking about reaping and sowing, remember? Put it in context. 
He plants this seed. The people of the city come out. They believe on him. In Syria, in, in Sikkar, in Samaria, where they don't believe in any Jews. Now remember these people who believed in Jesus were not saved. They couldn't be saved because Jesus didn't die for anybody's sins yet. They were, they were believing in him. So they had to get saved. How does that happen? Well, you want to see its fulfillment? Let's weave scripture together. We have to go to Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down, this is after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, to the city of Samaria. Let me suggest to you that is Sychar, and preached Christ to them. Who planted the seed there? Jesus did. Who watered it? Jesus did. Who reaped it? Philip did. Listen, now those who believed in Jesus just three years earlier at, at our, I'm getting chills, John chapter 4, now believe on Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection when Philip went there. The rest of chapter 4 deals with a nobleman. Man, I think we've gotten so much out of just the woman at the well. But let's go into this, the nobleman. Chapter 4, verse 46 to 54. And after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. So he stayed in Samaria two days, unheard of for a pure Jew. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his, home, in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. For they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water into wine. So let's look at what's going on here. This is lower Galilee. This is upper Galilee. Nazareth is here. Tiberius is here. So Jesus is going to Upper Galilee, around Capernaum in Upper Galilee. And he's going to the Galileans. Now, you may ask why. Well, he's passing through Nazareth, but he says, a prophet has no honor in his own country. It's, it's called familiarity. We all can suffer at, the, at times the familiarity of knowing Jesus, of knowing about the cross, knowing the greatest story that was ever told. You and I can get very familiar with our salvation. This isn't just for people who have occasionally heard about him. This is for us. This Easter season, like every other Easter season, I spent time on Good Friday reflecting about Jesus' suffering on the cross. Growing up Catholic, one of the things they wanted me to do on Good Friday, whether I wanted to or not, was spend from 12 o'clock noon to 3 o'clock the time that Jesus hung on the cross in silence in my room, thinking about it. You know, when I look back, it may have been a tradition, but this, every year since, especially since I've been saved, I don't take it for granted that Jesus went to the cross. This year, I spent time alone. And also, I watched old movies about the Passion Week. And I'm going to be honest with you, I wept when I saw what I already knew, what I've been preaching for years, the great pain and suffering of Jesus. I can't imagine what Jesus went through. And I'm going to be honest with you, even this last holy, it hurt me deeply. I cried to see the details of his death. Even though it was only a movie, even though it happened 2,000 years ago, I thought about what he must have felt. And it pained me. It pains me even thinking about it. There is such a thing as a false familiarity with Jesus. We may know him too much. We may be too familiar, I should say it that way. We may be too familiar with him. A dangerous feeling that we know all about him and his story. Such a dangerous feeling can lead to a lack of honor towards Jesus, a lack of respect to what he's done for us, a lack of true humility or love for who he is. Nazareth knew the boy that grew up among them. And we're all too familiar with that boy, so much so that they couldn't see the Son of God. But Upper Galilee, they received him. Why? Well, there was a couple of reasons. Number one, they're the furthest away from Jerusalem. They've been forgotten by the Pharisees, forgotten by everyone, and they're very poor. But they're ready. They're apocalyptic. They're ready for Messiah. And the Bible says they saw what he did, not in Nazareth, but in Jerusalem during the Passover, during the feast days. Some of them made their pilgrimage there, a lot of them. And they saw Jesus, and they knew that he was Galilean. Can you imagine how they swelled, realizing one of their own was healing in the temple, throwing over the Pharisees' wicked game and the... And the temple collectors, of the, ta the tax collectors, and the money exchangers. Can you imagine how they felt? This is a Galilean. This is one of us that has done this. And they were ready for him. They were ready to believe in him. So, and they made their pilgrimage. The nobleman, and it said, why Galileans believe? Perhaps I remember when Jesus turned to the merchant's tables in the outer courts of the temple. He's one of them. Jesus also predicted his own resurrection and performed many other unspecified signs 
when in Jerusalem, John says, many of them, that if they were written down, we wouldn't know all of them. The books wouldn't be able to contain them. So they saw it. So they are believers in Jesus when he gets to their, to their coastline. John chapter 4, verse 46, second part to 48 says this, the nobleman and his sick son. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Some people say Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will in no means believe me. What's he saying? Well, Jesus was at Cana, verse, verse 46, and the nobleman came from Capernaum to Cana to see Jesus. It's 80 miles away from Capernaum. Let me show you a chart. So here's Cana, here's Capernaum. He comes 80 miles to see Jesus by foot. Now from Nazareth to Cana, it's only about two miles. But this man comes 80 miles. His son is sick and he's at the point of death. Now Jesus is in the land of Zebulon and Nephthalim. Zebulon, Nephthalim. Here's Cana, there's Capernaum. Chorazin is there. Where he will spend quite some time and do most of his ministry. He will fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as one in vexation. When they first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the nations. As Isaiah is prophesying. The people that walked in darkness, that's the Galilee, have seen a great light. It's a prophecy of Jesus. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. Man prophesied that Jesus would spend his time in the Galilee. Now listen to it. The text says, a certain nobleman whose son was sick. He's in Capernaum. It's in the land of darkness, in the land of that valley. Literally, uh, this nobleman, literally is a royal person, an officer, probably of Herod Antipas. He implores Jesus to come to Capernaum because his son is sick. And notice the word says, he was at the point of death. Yes, death has a point. I reached it several times last year in my sickness. It's the point where life fades and the shadow of death starts to appear. This officer is desperate. Notice what Jesus said to him. It's not what he wanted to hear. He said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you won't believe me. He's rebuking him. It's a sharp rebuke. What was Jesus saying? You don't want to believe in me. You just want to receive from me. What he's saying is, you don't want to see my face, you want to see my hand. Whew. The real truth behind signs and wonders. Made a little chart for you. Signs and wonders can lead a person towards belief in God and can validate, can validate a heavenly messenger, no doubt. But they can also have no effect on a person. And Satan can also use flying signs and wonders. Just because God, Jesus, heals somebody doesn't mean that they believe in him. I mean, the whole idea he, he would heal, he said, believe me not for the works I do, but for what I say. I want you to remember that he healed probably thousands of people that we don't even know about, but they weren't there at the crucifixion. They weren't following him. Secondly, signs and wonders from God are obviously good things, but they should not form the foundation of our faith. We should not depend on them to prove God to us. In themselves, signs and wonders cannot change a heart. Israel saw incredible signs at Mount Sinai, and even heard the very voice of God. Yet a short time later, they worshiped the golden calf. Third, these words imply the contrast between the Samaritans who believed because of his word and the Jews who would not believe but through signs and prodigies or prophecies or wonders. So Jesus declares the nobleman, then Jesus declares right after this, after he says this, he declares the nobleman's son healed and the nobleman believes his word. He believes the declaration. Look at it, John 4, 49, 50. The noble said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Come back to my house. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. Now, if the nobleman wanted to see a sign and wanted to see Jesus there touching his son, he would have said, No, you've got to come down. But it says, So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. This nobleman doesn't plead his son's nobility, or that he's a great child, or his only child if he was, or that he should receive special favor. And in spite of Jesus just rebuking him and saying that people such as him only seek signs, the nobleman continues to plead 
because he said death's door was opening for his son. He was desperate. Someone said to me recently, man, Pastor Mark, you were at death's door, to which I replied, no, I was in the door. I was sitting in, the, in death's living room. Thank God Jesus isn't afraid and wasn't afraid to enter death's door and res rescue those in death's living room. Man, it amazes me. Jesus simply says to the nobleman, go your way, your son lives. What does it take? It takes him believing the word of God. That, the word of God that we're reading to you tonight should spring up hope in you. You should believe on the word. I don't care if you ever see another sign. Believe the word of God. I don't care if I ever see another sign. I will. So you will. Because I believe in the word of God, not the signs. Go your way, your son lives. Jesus was forcing this man to believe his word or not. Testing his faith. Remember, the man asked Jesus to come down to Capernaum. Jesus said, believe me, your son lives. Faith. It's his word alone. Not some, not some demonstration of his miracles. The nobleman, to his credit, simply believes Jesus' three words for the healing of his son. Your son lives. What if I said to you today, when you were praying about your son or your daughter that's wayward and away from God, what if I said, what if you wanted to see something happen in their life and you're looking for something, something of a tangible way? What if I said to you, your son will come back to the faith. Your son will come back to God. Your daughter will come back to God. Would you believe me? What if you've been praying and praying and you're looking for some manifestation over your, over your body, some sign? What if I said to you, you will be healed. There are people listening to me right now, I'm getting chills, and you've been suffering. Let me tell you, you will be healed. It's the word of God. No drama, no spectacle, no outstretched arms, no fanfare, just three words. Three words. Your son lives. Then the nobleman discovers that his son is healed. And he discovers when it happens. And this is powerful. And as he was going down, that means back to Capernaum, his servants met him and said, told him, saying, your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. They said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew it was at that same hour which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea of Galilee. Second sign. Let's finish it up tonight. Now watch. Because this is the proof of the nobleman's faith. While he was coming, somebody meets him. They're obviously coming to tell him something. And they're telling him that your son recovered. Don't miss, the, don't miss what I actually made as a Corellianism. You remember those? But before I get there, listen to it. According to your servants, this happened yesterday at the seventh hour. This means that the nobleman took his time to return to his meeting with Jesus in Cana, back to his home in Capernaum. His leisurely pace was a demonstration of faith. He didn't run right back. In fear, the nobleman ran from Capernaum to Canaan, but in faith, he walked from Cana back to Capernaum. He trusted Jesus that his son would be alive, and he took his time getting back. That's real faith. So here's your, here's your Corellianism. Fear pushes us to panic. Faith pushes us to peace. Do you have fear tonight? You're going to have panic. Whatever you fear, it's going to bring panic. Do you have faith? You will have peace. It's a powerful statement. Let me repeat it. Fear pushes us to panic. Faith pushes us to peace. In my sickness, I look back at it and every day was a struggle. After I woke up, every day was a struggle. To some degree, it still is. But I have never feared with tomorrow, Abraham. I've always trusted God. Not that I'm some great person of faith. I'm just believing in God. I believe Him. And when I walk in a place today, I walked to a, to a meeting today with someone and they were flabbergasted, almost fell on the ground. You're not supposed to be walking. Don't tell me what I'm not supposed to be doing because my faith is pushing me. It's pushing me to peace. One of the videographers that are here tonight brought a little uh, thumb drive, um, Brian. And he said to me, man, you I looked over this. I have, it, it holds a lot of my teachings. And he'll give them to me after he's done with so many. I don't know how many Brian are on it. I don't know how many teachers are on it. 30. He said, I looked at the first one. We started on this. It was when you first did this Wednesday night study. And you looked, he said, don't mind me saying you looked horrible. You looked like death. You were pale. You were skinny. You were, and he said, and I looked at what you are now. And he said, it was just unbelievable to him. 
that's because faith pushes us to peace and it makes us push on. I encourage you tonight, don't let panic push you. Let faith push you. Panic's only going to push you to fear. Remember, the man asked Jesus to come down to Capernaum and Jesus, all he said was, your son lives. Today, tonight, John ends chapter 4 with these words. Ah, before I do it, let me give you the second sign. He says, this is the, he says, this is the second sign. Remember right there. This is the second sign that he didn't. The first sign persuaded his disciples. It's turning water into wine. The second sign persuaded, persuaded a Jewish nobleman in his household. The Samaritan be believed without a sign. Think about it. The first two signs in the Gospel of John took place at Cana of Galilee. The first was at the best party ever, a wedding party. The second was connected with the worst tragedy ever, the illness and soon death of a child. Yet Jesus was real in both aspects. He'll go to your party and speak a word of life. He'll go to the place of death and speak a word of life. In the Gospel of John, signs are given to lead the reader to faith. We'll get there someday in John chapter 20. But the relationship between faith, which is belief, and signs is clear in John chapter 2 and chapter 4. Faith is not hoping God can, it's knowing you will. So tonight as we close, let me ask you, do you believe before you see? Do you believe it before you see it? Do you believe the word of God before you ever see it? That's faith. Let's believe on his word tonight for your marriage, for your family, for your children, for your grandchildren, for your finances, or for anything else that could cause panic in your life. Let's not be pushed by panic and fear. Let's be pushed by faith and believe. Father, tonight I thank you. I praise you, Lord God, for your word. Thank you for this study. John is showing us. He's giving us an A to Z of who you are, whether, you're, whether it's to a nobleman or whether it's to the lower classes, Lord. It's so powerful, Lord. It reminds me of, it reminds you of your birth in Bethlehem, where kings from the east came to see you, but the lowly shepherds were there also. Lord, thank you that you have run the gamut for us. Every one of us, Lord God, you would have it that none would perish. And tonight, Lord, let us believe on your word. Lord, we will see the signs if we just believe on your word, but not for the sign's sake, but for your word's sake. We believe in you, Lord. I pray miracles in lives right now because people listening are believing on your word. Bless them tonight, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Remember next week, Lord willing, we'll be right here. God bless you.